Hello. Welcome to the second event in the Davis Museum's virtual artist talk series, Handmade Photography Today. My name is Carrie Cushman, and I'm the Linda Wyatt Gruber Class of 1966 Curatorial Fellow in Photography at the Davis. Tonight, I am so pleased to welcome the artist Edie Bressler, who will be speaking about her work with cyanotypes as a strategy for community engagement. We begin with a late native land acknowledgement. The Davis Museum at Wellesley College is located on the ancestral and unceded tribal lands of the Massachusetts people. We acknowledge the continuing presence of the Massachusetts and their relatives and neighbors, the Wampanoag and Nipmuc peoples, and pay respect to indigenous elders past and present. A few notes about how to participate in today's program. Please note that this event is being recorded and will be made available online in the coming days. We are using a webinar format and your microphone and video have been turned off during the presentation. Throughout the event, you can use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to enter your questions and to upvote other people's questions. We will leave about 20 minutes at the end for questions. The Davis Museum is grateful to the Byrne Schwartz Family Foundation for sponsoring the Handmade Photography Today Artist Talk series. We would also like to acknowledge our co-hosts, the Photographic Resource Center. Located at Lesley University, the PRC hosts exhibitions, presentations, and gatherings that support the creation and understanding of light-based media with the goal of inspiring its members, educational institutions, and the photography community with new work, ideas, and methods. Next spring, the PRC will be hosting a series of its own handmade photography workshops, and tonight's speaker, Edie Bressler, will be leading two classes on how to make cyanotypes on May 22nd and June 5th. It's a very exciting opportunity to learn more from this dynamic artist. So if you're interested in participating, please visit the PRC's website for more information at prcboston.org. Our discussant for this evening is Patricia Berman, the Theodore L. and Stanley H. Professor of Art here at Wellesley College, where she teaches modern and contemporary art, the history of photography, and propaganda studies. She has also taught at NYU and the University of Oslo. She has published books on Danish, Belgian, and Norwegian art and has curated exhibitions in the US and throughout Europe. Her most recent exhibition, The Experimental Self, Edvard Munch's Photography, has been seen, which has been seen in five cities so far, will open in Seattle at the Nordic Museum a week from today. And the book, The Experimental Self, will launch next week at the museum opening. Uh, many congratulations to Pat. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, Edie Bressler. Bressler is a 2017 recipient of a Massachusetts Cultural Council Fellowship in Photography. Her projects have been featured on Good Morning America and PBS Greater Boston, as well as in Photograph Magazine, Lens Scratch, Slate, Photo District News, Business Insider, Esquire Russia, and many other publications. She is represented by Gallery Caiaphas in Boston, and her work has been exhibited in Pingyao, China, the Davis Orton Gallery, Photoville, SIPA Buffalo, the Visual Studies Workshop, the Griffin Museum of Photography, and numerous group exhibitions. Bressler's photographs are part of permanent collections at the Houston Museum of Fine Arts the Danforth Museum of Art, and the Polaroid Collection. She has a BFA from the School of Visual Arts in New York City and an MFA from LUCAD Boston. She lives in Somerville, Massachusetts, and is director of the photography program at Simmons College. Welcome, Edie, and thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you so much, Carrie, for that generous introduction. And hello to everybody uh, out there who I cannot see, but I, I know you are there. So welcome. Um, I'm so glad that you could join us. Um, I do wanna extend a, such an enormous thank you to Carrie Cushman 
for not only putting this symposium together, but keeping it going uh, even after the pandemic and subsequent quarantine. So kudos to Carrie for all of her hard work. So here we are. And I wanna start by just saying how much I love this medium. And to say that I love it today just as much as I loved it when I started with my first camera at the age of 13. I also love teaching the art and critical aesthetic of photography. And I want to extend a warm welcome uh, to all the students who are joining us this evening. Thank you for that. Since the pandemic and subsequent quarantine began in March, time has fractured and perception about so many things has shifted. I am still going to speak, of course, about the role chance plays in my handmade artistic practice but I am also compelled to talk about how the past seven months have reshaped my thinking. To begin, photography is a relational, active, and very flexible medium. Maker and photographer, I am in conversation with a person, a place, a moment, a time. And then there are a myriad of approaches or hybrid combinations to crystallize that moment into a frame. When my son Aaron was, uh, was, was younger, he's now 23, he and his friends loved to do take aparts on our porch. Basically, this meant supplying them with screwdrivers, hammers, and snacks, and letting them strip an obsolete piece of machinery down to its individual parts. I was reminded of this when I started thinking about handmade photography, because I also take the medium apart and put it back together a little differently each time. So, Let's review the parts together. We have a camera and a lens. Of course, there is light. There are chemical reactions that help form and then fix the image and time to observe and make the exposure. Now, not all of them are necessary. And in fact, many of the projects I'm going to share with you this evening, I don't use a camera or a lens. There is also no immediacy like there is with digital picture making. Handmade processes require time and patience. This means I often have to try techniques to see what happens and how they work and then refine the process and try it again. And this is where chance comes into play. For me, handmade photography builds on mistakes and doubt as a way of opening up new possibilities, new ways of forming connections, new ways of making an image, I can make connections with the world and even with people across my community. For me, chance means preparing for that instructive accident. When I moved to Somerville in 1997 and my son was born, I had window screens for the first time since I was a kid. This early series of photographs began after physically cutting my fiberglass window screen. I wanted to see how it would alter a photograph of the view outside. So I am physically and also metaphorically letting more light in. This led to days of quilting and sewing new screens that I now attach to canvas stretchers. I made cyanotype prints from the sewn screens. And I also photograph through them to the outside world. Using photography in multiple ways to explore the same idea or subject is an essential part of my practice. I am curious about pushing at the boundaries of what a photograph can be and how hybrid approaches inform meaning. My photographs often take weeks to construct. In this way, I am intentionally coalescing multiple days, ideas, and experiences into a single frame. I think of Carlton Watkins, who in the 19th century began exposing separate negatives for the land and the sky. You see, photographic emulsions in the 19th century uh, were more sensitive to blue and violet light and this resulted in skies that were often overexposed and did not record the clouds that could be seen with the naked eye. 
Art historians have discovered that Watkins kept a folder of cloud negatives for this very purpose. I love these early photographs and the experience of wondering if the skies inserted were actually from the same day, the same time, or even the same place. And what does that mean for how we experience the moment today? During lockdown, I was really missing the freedom of the open road and the beautiful, unpredictable wanderlust that comes from these adventures. I have always known this freedom, but now that it is limited, more than I could ever have imagined, I am seeing what a privilege that freedom is. As a consolation, I began to revisit old negatives and slides, and by chance, experimenting with this humble office tool. Studying the skies within each photograph, the skies of every memory, I added a perfectly colored hole punch moon. I was so surprised at the resulting transformation. I am literally punctuating and spiritually enhancing the moment, just like Watkins and his clouds. Both of us are engaging with a physical amelioration of a moment. We're trying to make it better. I started using handmade processes, handmade pho photographic processes like cyanotype because I wanted to loosen the anchor that was planted so firmly in the world of my sight. Cyanotypes and other handmade processes reinvigorate the materiality of a photograph by activating other senses and ways of interpretation. Since the pandemic, we are online even more than before. We are online right now. When I am physically engaged in making a cyanotype, I am liberated from the world of screens and sight. In Camera Lucida, Roland Barth describes the photograph as literally an emanation of the referent, the referent being the person, the place, the thing that is being photographed. And he writes, from a real body which was there, proceed radiations which ultimately touch me, who am here. The photograph of the missing being, as Sontag says, will touch me like the delayed rays of a star. When Barth borrowed that phrase from Sontag, he was speaking only about images made with a camera. I want to make the case this evening for a similar experience of emanations using cyanotypes. Cyanotype actually means blue imprint and it is exposed in either sunlight or some other UV light source. No camera or lens is necessary. Sir John Herschel, a British chemist and astronomer and inventor was first to recognize that iron salts could be made light sensitive. I have so much respect for Herschel as an inventor, but also as a teacher. He encouraged Julia Marker Cameron who made this extraordinary portrait of him. So what is the process? We have two iron salts, potassium ferrocyanide and ferric ammonium citrate. They are exposed in sunlight or some other UV light source, and then they're developed in water and they are permanent. If washed well, they'll last longer than most many other kinds of photographs on paper. It's pure magic. Herschel was also indirectly a teacher to Anna Atkins, who was the first to record botanical specimens using the cyanotype process. She also produced one of the earliest manuscripts completely illustrated by the lensless tracings of her botanical subjects. And plant specimens are still the most popular source material we use today. While we were all quarantining at home, so many people were sharing their cyanotype experiments online. I even got my students to begin making them. I'm not sure why plants are still so widely used. Perhaps it is an homage to Atkins or because they produce silhouettes in a wide variety of shapes and patterns that are easily recognized. Many contemporary artists have renewed interest in the process. Among them, Megan Riepenhoff, John Dugdale, 
Jean Dali, Marco Breuer, and my personal favorite, Christian Markley. In 2009, he began making a series of cyanotypes using old cassette tapes as source material. And this is what he made. He also took the cassettes apart and placed the, the pieces, especially the unspooled magnetic tape on top of the emulsion. I love how the magnetic tape, this antiquated form of sound is transfigured into something alive and growing like blades of grass. So let's take this process apart together. Underneath the sheet of glass are strips of paper, both translucent and solid. I've placed them on top of a page that I coated earlier with the cyanotype emulsion. I can remove each strip according to predetermined lengths of time so that either areas are exposed or blocked from sunlight. In this way, I am drawing with light and making a photogram that recalls an experience. This is a photograph unmoored and disconnected from the physical world. In other words, the referent, the referent, remember that thing the photograph represents, resides not in the world as we know it, but in our collective imagination. I think of these cyanotypes as sense memories. I was not able to enjoy the beach the way I have in summers past. So making these during lockdown was a kind of mental and emotional reenactment, a joyful liberation from quarantine. To make a template, I close my eyes and focus on that memory of summer, sitting on a beach and looking at the sea. And then I reshape that memory using paper and cardboard, anticipating how sunlight and time will form the image. Chance becomes my dynamic teacher because I'm not sure until I process them if my perception has worked. When brushing the emulsion onto the page for this one, I randomly and intentionally left some areas uncoated. The paper white markings juxtaposed against the cyanotype blue lines and shapes form and mimic for me the feeling of being on the beach on a windy day. I was making a lot of these during lockdown and the freedom of these imaginary spaces helped ameliorate the feeling of disaffection I felt from being stuck indoors. It made me so grateful to be an artist. The Edge of Sight by Sean Michelle Smith contains a series of essays that helped me understand more about how photographs or more specifically how cyanotype photograms can suggest deeper ideas and meaning. I am referring to what Walter Benjamin called the optical unconscious. The optical unconscious refers to the spaces in between what we know or what we see. It taps into the unconscious behind or underneath a moment, into that vast database of images burned deeply into our psyches, waiting to be awakened like a sleepy giant. It reveals what is present, whether we see it or not. It explains a lot. During the summer of 2017, after what had been a roller coaster year sowing deeper divisions across our country, I set out walking in Somerville, Cambridge, and Boston, neighborhoods nearby where I live. I carried with me light tight packages containing sheets of vellum that I had hand coated with a cyanotype emulsion the night before. My intention was to make a light drawing or trace of connection with one or more strangers in an unscripted encounter. And this is what we made. An actual size tracing with mysterious emanations from the sunlight and the heat dancing in and underneath the shadows of their extended arms. I cannot fully explain how these markings, markings happen 
or repeat them. Like the unique art object that is created, this unexpected transference of self is also a singular portrait. Approaching strangers to make a portrait has a long and rocky tradition in photography. When I set out on the street to make one of these cyanotypes, I still take intention with me. I just don't take my camera. At the outset, I am approaching people and asking them to collaborate with me to make something. But a lot of explanation and conversation happens before we even begin to make a print. Exposures are long and last between 14 and 20 minutes. So it's important that participants have some idea of what they are getting into. For the entire duration of the exposure, participants are in direct contact with the iron salt emulsion, while we are in another kind of contact simultaneously with each other. I welcome their enthusiasm to choose not only how they will lay their hands upon the page and move them around, but also adding other elements like these small pieces of clover. But I cannot anticipate the unique indelible markings made from sunlight traveling underneath fingernails or what happens when a participant begins to perspire onto the page and the emulsion. Iron salts are much slower than the more traditional black and white uh, gelatin silver emulsion. And this allows participants to lift their hand and peek underneath to see how the sunlight is interacting with the chemistry, another kind of magic. Sometimes participants will recognize the shape of their fingernails, a rolled up shirt sleeve, their bracelets or a watch. But in general, there is no self critiquing of their hair, their expression or their clothes. Individuality is more often replaced by a communal recognition. So let me explain. Even though every participant receives an image copy of their process cyanotype, when the project was installed, many participants began to recognize themselves in someone else's outstretched hand. So as the project grew in number, this misidentification results in new connections. In this way, each unique physical trace becomes part of a larger portrait a larger group portrait. I also want to acknowledge that it is very humbling to do this kind of social relational work. On many days, everyone I approached refused or was in a hurry to be someplace else. You just cannot take it personal. You just, what I would do is just reconnect with my resolve and continue walking with those light type packages, hopeful, that the next person I met, the next person I made eye contact with would agree and say yes. And that is how the project got its name. This first installation of all 129 participants is a portrait of that collective yes. This is my third relational community project and the first to use only cyanotypes. And here is my optical unconscious at work because once the project was installed, I remembered bicycling to my local library when I was very young to look at a book containing reproductions of the mysterious cave paintings discovered in France, Borneo, Argentina, and Spain. I love these collective gestures from our ancestral past. These gestures, these traces, we don't know even who or what gender made them, but archaeologists surmise that perhaps they put a liquid pigment in their mouths and placing their hand upon the cave wall, <laughs> blew around it to create a handprint, a mark that remains today. And I think part of the power is that we recognize ourselves. My projects have taken me across this country many times, and I have met and found commonality with people 
uh, and families across both sides of the chasm that presently divides us. Because making something with others is how I work to convey a vision for rebuilding a larger, better us. Last summer, I began thinking about how could I continue to expand this YES project? I chose to invite former participants along with friends and students to experiment with combining people across my disparate communities. I would ask participants to physically reach across the dividing lines of individual pages. So this is from my sketchbook. My plan was to cut the original 18 by 24 inch sheets two ways and then alternate how the pages would meet side by side or up and down. Spatially, they cover the same area. So you can see here on the left, Sini is lying on top of two vertical nine by 24 sheets and Grant next to her on the right is lying down on two 12 by 18 horizontal. Participants reach their arms, bodies and torsos across the physical break between the coded pages. And so in this detail, you can see the, finger, the fingertips kind of dancing across that break. After processing, I began forming new connections by combining cyanotype photograms from different days and different places. The results are hybrids that once again merge the individual into a larger portrait of us. Each break is a space of invitation. I'm asking viewers to see potential connections across the boundaries. The titles reference the number of people involved each day to create the final unified figure. And sometimes um, I was able to make multiple versions. So this, we have six participants here on four days, but I could substitute a different one on the upper left, and then it becomes seven participants and five days. When I'm working with participants, I'm listening carefully. I'm making quick observations and adjustments. I am actually active for the entire length of the exposure. And so this makes it very similar to creating a traditional photographic portrait with a camera. Participants and I talk, tell jokes and stories, and sometimes they just close their eyes and we are quiet together. This portion was made at Wellesley last summer, along with the participation of Dr. Carrie Cushman and students Aviv, Alicia, Stephanie, and Megan. And then this bottom portion was made with a colleague and students from Simmons. I could acknowledge Jacqueline, Lucky, and Cherry. And this is them together. I feel important that I acknowledge these photogram tracings create no cultural markings. And I'm very mindful of that. I'm choosing to use a process that can accentuate what we have in common over who we are as individuals. Preparing for my recent exhibition at Gallery K office in Boston, the long verticality that resulted from this combination inspired me to experiment with a new technique. I made digital copies of the individual cyanotypes and then printed them on a silk banner using pigment inks. You can see from this installation view that the resulting banner hangs away from the wall, activating a space towards the center of the gallery. Likewise, these four separate cyanotypes are filling the void across a corner, another area of a gallery that is traditionally empty. I realize doubt may not be visible, but I do want to acknowledge it is a big part of every image and every project. 
When I approach a stranger on the street, I need to summon a resolve against social barriers that inhibit and discourage people from engaging randomly with one another. More and more young people are, are being told never to engage uh, with strangers. And I hear also from my students how unsafe they feel walking around the city. I am inspired by their generosity and willingness to step outside the personal bubble we are all sort of creating these days and take the chance to make something. As I've been walking around these past several months, not only is everyone still on their phone, but now we are all maintaining social distance. I worry that as a community, we are becoming even more physically disconnected than before. Fostering new connections through these community relational projects is how I seek to repair that distrust, distance, and disconnect. I know that fear or mistrust of the other and the unknown is often what keeps humans apart. And for me, the fear of not being able to engage is motivation to continue trying. I do look forward to reinventing a way of continuing to make this work again one day. I am gratified by the time participants give to me and this long process. For these three budding teens, 15 minutes was a really excruciating long time. And the process of making these depends so much on their patience and willingness to perform clumsy and sometimes physically awkward positions. When I started making these projects in 2017, our country was already in a difficult place. Now, it's almost unrecognizable. I find myself most recently turning my focus inward and making cyanotypes that are very different from these because they are much more personal. And that is strange for me because I've never actually made a project that is so overtly personal. During lockdown, I found these early photographs of my parents and I was struck by how happy they seemed to me. My mother was diagnosed with ALS when I was 13, the same year I got my first camera and she died four years later. My father remarried and the following year, my siblings and I just naturally dispersed to begin our own lives. I started making these cyanotypes, combining a digital negative with objects I have that used to belong to them. So here I'm using notions from my mother's sewing box. And here, my father's engineering templates. Where my other projects seek to ameliorate the moment, these cyanotypes are reflecting more directly on loss and more specifically, my personal loss. And in this one, they are literally fading from view. These nostalgic personal cyanotypes do not make me sad. Rather, the physical act of making them are a way to bridge pain and loss. And they, the making of them are giving me a chance to reflect and in many ways come to terms. Handmade photography is how I spiritualize a moment, a place, my community, and even those who reside only in my memory. Even when I am filled with doubt, making photographs, has given me a lot of joy. Making cyanotypes is part of how I counter the daily toll of quarantine and this pandemic. And I feel it important to say that without photographs and without connecting to that kind of joy, I realize that all I have is the grief and pain that continues to keep us apart. Thank you. Hi, Edie. Hi. Hi. Um, hi, I'm Pat Berman. I've been silenced, which is rare. Um, 
I, first of all, I want to thank Carrie and Arthurina for making this possible. And Carrie, you've been incredibly patient and resourceful over the months that you have um, reconstituted this uh, dialogue across time and space. And Edie, especially, thank you so much for the presentation and for your work. I have a number of responses and questions, um, things I would love to ask you to tease out a little bit further that you just presented to us. Um, and I, I want to begin by thanking you for your generosity in sharing both your work and your dilemma uh, as a maker right now. I think one is uh, we're sharing this dilemma as we try to find ways of ethically being in the world right now as, as producers of art or producers of ideas. And um, to respond first to your closing remarks, um, you know we spoke the other day about what it means to be a, make, a maker at this troubling moment and what it means to find joy in bringing something into the world and the ambivalence one might have an, as an artist to both experience and to give joy. Um, and um, it caused me to think about something I actually put on my syllabus for this next uh, quarter. I'm gonna share my screen. Let's see, did that just work? Mm -hmm. You see my screen? Okay. Um, so I put this, it's something that I've put on my syllabi now and again, and actually my colleague Nikki Green just uh, made this same reference in a different podcast yesterday. But whether in the privacy of your studio or in the public square, making something joyful or making something vulnerable or something tragic is maybe an imperative that we all have. So I wanna thank you for continuing forth. Now, um, you began by saying, I love this medium. <laughs> I love this medium. And I love that you love this medium because I love this medium um, too. And I have a few uh, questions to follow up. I wanna talk with you a little bit about materiality. Mm -hmm. I wanna talk about your love of chance. Um, I want to talk about your engagement or the politics um, of representations within and of community. And then I wanna talk a little bit about time and anachronism, because I think your work is deeply anachronistic. I guess all photography in some way is anachronistic, meaning reaching across time, having two moments of time, different moments of time touch. And um, throughout, I understand you'd always be in dialogue with others and always collaborating across space and time. So that's where I'd like to offer right. some talk about space, the amelioration of or the acknowledgement mm -hmm. of space and time. So in terms of materiality to start, um, I don't even know where you even start with <laughs> the anotypes. Um, one of the things, I think this is true, but it's, it's a truly marvelous thing about this particular medium that we're seeing um, on the screen. And I've also brought up a, a point of comparison, your optical unconscious from, from Argentina. Um, Cyanotypes are alive and, and regenerating, right? That they start to fade and you put them in a dark place, they bring their values back. Isn't that correct? That, 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 is, um, that is true. Um, they're also, you know, there aren't, I, I don't know many people who actually keep all their images out in the sunlight all the time. So, you know, for me, um, I think they are like many photographs, uh, uh, they are a crystallation of a moment. How you take care of them perhaps depends on how long they will exist in the world. You know, the funny thing about the caves, of course, and the tragic thing is that they've had to close these caves because uh, as people go in to visit and our respiration uh, and air and all the things that we bring into those caves, uh, there has been a deterioration of these ancestral markings. So, you know, we are stewards of the environment. We are stewards of art. And it is up to us to learn the best way to preserve not only uh, the image, but the moments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really striking that very soon we'll only know these, we only know them now through images, right? Uh, through the image. Um, so, I, you know, it's striking. It just one of the things I was thinking about the cyanotype is that since it can regenerate, it fades, but it can regenerate. It needs rest. It needs rest, right? But like we do, and we can regenerate with some rest. Um, the, the medium also calls forth any number of associations. I mean, you've spoken already about Anna Atkins. This happens to be a print that we, we have in the Davis Museum. That's part of the Davis Museum. 
and also bringing forth um, Susan Weil and um, Robert Rauschenberg's collaborations in the early 50s. So I'm really interested in um, this issue of what we see when we see this material. Mm -hmm. uh, what we see in time when we see this material, because obviously it's a very, very old technique and strategy of making. And I wonder if you could talk about seeing through time a little bit, these different points um, in the history of making. Yeah, I, I love, thank you so much. It's a wonderful question. I mean, I, I feel as though it is a kind of liberation from the present. Um, you know, so many photographs are anchored in that moment in the physical world. And I think cyanotypes, especially this form, these tracings, um, are a form of time travel and liberation, optical con unconscious travel. They suggest so many different things to different people. Um, and I think it's uh, uh, that freedom as a maker is, is such, it's so joyful, it's so wonderful, you know? And I think especially to me over the past seven months, it was a way of separating from a daily onslaught of images that were so upsetting and made me so angry. Um, I find great release. And I think that, you know, I, I love the series that Weil and Rauschenberg did in the 50s. And, you know, they seem to be having so much fun. Yeah. And I think we don't often think about art as being fun. And, and, uh, and when I was doing the relational projects, again, of course, there were always the lengthy moments where nobody wanted to participate. And, and that made me very sad. But as soon as somebody said yes, all of that disappeared. And it became a, a focus between me and that person to make something. And it was a fantastic period of time. It's because of course, it's not only a moment anymore. Sometimes we would spend 30 minutes to make something and then just spend another 20 minutes talking. That never happens. So I, I'm so in, well, I'm going to go forward with another slide, which is your work rather than somebody else's work to think about uh, this thing that you just said, which is that you have these encounters, you have these conversations. Um, there is this, you know, 20 minute or so period in which bodies are on the ground, lying down or reaching or doing whatever, twisting, doing whatever they're doing. And uh, because already cameraless photography is so much about process. And the people with whom you're collaborating are performing, you know, sort of within the process. I'm really interested in hearing you talk a little bit more about what, what you actually see in these shadows, because shadows are in the end kind of the precipitate, you know, the sediment or the, you know, what's left behind from presence that light has done the action along with people. But as you think about the stories and you think about the relationships, I, I'm sure you have anecdotes to share about these different touches, these different moments. I wonder if you'd talk further about that. So it's very interesting because when I look at these, I see the people. I mean, I still remember, I can look and say, oh, that's Grant and there's Abby and there's Ashley. And so I, I remember the people's names. Um, nobody else is going to experience that. So that is something that, uh, is specific to, to me. Um, so I do see them, but I also see this kind of wonderful, mysterious, magical emanation of like their presence emerging out of the paper. Um, I mean, we're using so many different things. I, I bring a lot of materials with me uh, along with these light tight packages. Um, so I have like a whole bag of tricks and you know, I will spill them out on the ground and, and sort of say, well, you know, these are things that we can also add and we can use. And it's really, it's like um, a wonder, it's like a happening. It reminds me so much of a sort of a group happening, um, you know, from again, talk about anachronism a time way before, but what's, I think again, what's so liberating is none of us know what we're gonna make, what it's gonna come out looking like. 
And so there's this constant feeling of, so what, what about this? So during that 20 minutes, people are, can I do this? Sure. What if I do this? Oh, sure, let's go. And so there's this a lot of activity. Um, on the left, we had some participants uh, who were not laying their hands down and they were running around grasping at uh, pieces of grass and flowers nearby and throwing them on, <laughs> you know, and then we had to take them out of people's hair and some people just close their eyes. And um, so I see a lot of that. I see a lot of the mayhem and merriment that went into the, to the making of them. But I also am so captivated by, again, the, this, the magic of what happens, the transformation. I'd like to say that you know, you're, the, the fact that you indicate how many days and how many participants uh, were in the making of each of your uh, constellations of images, I think that there's something that you share with us about the anarchy and the joyfulness and the chance encounters by, mm -hmm. by letting us know, having us then start to think about time and space and who was there and who, who wasn't there. But um, I also want to ask you about two things having to do with then, you know, turning both to materiality and to chance and actually to community engagement, which is you're asking people, you're having a dialogue with people, sometimes children who are like a little twitchy and don't want to be lying down for 20 minutes, but they're doing it in public spaces. And I'm, you just talked about performance art, um, this interactional art that you produce, but can you talk a little bit about what happens, not just on the paper with your collaborators, but what happens around you? Because you're in public doing this, right? Right. It's really interesting because one, sometimes people will come over and they want to ask questions. So what's going on? But more often than not, nobody engages with us. We remain in that little bubble uh, that people are getting so used to kind of walking around in. Um, and so most people just continue to pass us by. They kind of glance over their shoulder. Um, every now and again, somebody will stop to ask more questions. Uh, I think one of the nice things that's happened for me is sometimes after we've made this thing, I'll be walking uh, in Somerville or in Cambridge and I'll see a participant. And, and I always recognize them. Sometimes it takes them a moment to remember. But as soon as I say, oh, we made that cyanotype. Oh, hi, how are you? And I think it's such a special experience. Um, it is this thing that we share forever. And so it connects us in a way forever. Um, I wish more people would become curious and come over and ask us what we're doing. But I think people are getting inured to that. I think people are learn are teaching themselves to ignore to not engage it, at least in new england this has been my experience perhaps in other cities if i get the chance uh, i want to take this on the road and we'll see if that happens if that's true uh, in other places well, you know the, uh, your work has looked so different to me in these last six seven months and one of the things that's striking to me is how <clears throat> how fearful we have become of touching yeah and each other touching surfaces that that i look at these images and they're so exuberant they're so utterly exuberant i see i feel some loss mm -hmm. and yeah you do as well yeah. but um they're also i wanted to ask you this and see if you could talk about this a little bit too there are two things that are really striking to me about your images i mean many things one is you never quite know where the surface is in, in, a, in a cyanotype. And some of these hands, some of these figures look like they could be underwater and emerging. They could be, they could be anywhere, which I find you know, kind of fascinating in terms of locating something in, in space. The second thing I guess I wanna say is that they're really haptic mm -hmm. visual images. You touch them with your eye. They're very, they're very present as, as touch. Mm -hmm. and, and I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit, your choice of the medium of cyanotype to begin with. Yeah, well, that's that optical unconscious. Um, and I, you know, I had done uh, two previous community projects using my camera and, and there was um, 
some real difficulties using a camera in this way in that when they were installed, the first thing people always said about themselves when they saw themselves in a photograph, they commented on, oh, you know, their hair or, oh, that's what I was wearing that day or, um, and then they could get perhaps past that. Uh, the cyanotypes are a way, I mean, I love that you use the word haptic because I think that's really true that um, it's a way for people to see a different aspect of their energy, a, a, a different aspect of themselves performing something, um, a different way for them to connect to their bodies, to their uh, fellow person, you know, in the experience. And then not only then, but in the installation, a different way for them to uh, see themselves or form connections with others. Uh, and see a different kind of us. So, you know, I was very specific in choosing a process that to me, I think does evoke uh, this ethereal feeling perhaps of air and water, something that dematerializes the moment and makes it, makes us able to connect with it on a, on a different, more unconscious level. Mm -hmm. Um, Edie, I, 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 I love what you're saying, and I'm just so struck by how, you know, so many of us in this world walk around with, you know, that, uh, <laughs> our, our, you know, the, 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 the scale and the specificity, we all curate ourselves, right, if we're putting ourselves in public, right, um, and we're so used to this kind of crisp, hyper-specific, self-curated way of being that I, I find these to be so utterly liberating mm. in the ways that you were talking about. And the fact that there are these shadow distillations, which are the opposite of, the, and they're large, the opposite of these tiny little specific controlled um, images. So the lack of offering um, agency in a different way is, is extraordinary. Which um, actually leads me to then the next thing I wanted to kind of think about. Um, I, I really love uh, the way you've talked about your 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 collaborators mm -hmm. losing themselves and finding themselves once they see the the images in the, for example, in the gallery. And I wonder if you could elaborate that a little bit. I think you used the term that there are no cultural markings. Um, right. They lose their cultural markings. They lose their cultural markers in the images and so you know they they're they're genderless they're you know in some way or another they're ageless ethnicity becomes a question ableism becomes a question national origin becomes a question and the fact that they uh, miss see themselves they misremember themselves and project themselves into another i think it's like a fascinating part of your practice um and I wonder if you could talk about that's a ch another chance operation on the on the yeah. level of reception, right? But um, has that that recognition of misrecognition ch changed your the dynamics of your practice? In fact, well, I find it very exciting, you know, and I think that um, you know, actually, that I was surprised that that happened because again, I sent everybody. I was very careful to send every participant uh, an image copy of themselves. And it was only after the installations with the first one, uh, which was um, the curator Bridget Lynch, the brilliant curator Bridget Lynch, who used to run the Trustman Gallery at Simmons College, uh, sort of giving me the chance again, you know, uh, and, and same with uh, Arlette Kayafis. These projects, when I begin them, there's nothing. And so I have to engage enough people to make something happen. And so I'm very careful in the process to send people, I feel a responsibility to send them something. And then once they were installed and I just was so fascinated that people came in and I could see them and I went over to say hello and they said, yeah, this is me. And I was like, actually, no, that one's you. And I'm like, no, 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 this is me. And that kind of refusal um, and I knew it because I, I could even lift up a little piece of the cyanotype on the back and pencil, I write everybody's names. 
but I decided not to do that, to allow this kind of misidentification to take place and just sort of see that unfold. Um, I've had participants say things like, that can't be me. I don't look like that. And I think that's so funny because I know you don't look like that. That's the whole point. Um, so it becomes, I think, again, another way for, I guess, people to engage with the works. It certainly is a way that I'm engaging with them. Mm -hmm. How many artworks do that, give that permission? Again, when I learned about the, the Carlton Watkins pieces, um, wow, that reactivated those 19th century photographs for me in a way that I can't even describe. I mean, I had looked at those images and loved them for years, but once I learned about the clouds from Mia Feynman, um, I never looked at them the same ever again completely transformed them for me. I love that. I love yeah. that. Because yeah, we, we also often forget that uh, what happens after a photograph is made in, in a camera or not on a camera and not as you do it on paper, that's sometimes where the fun begins, right? In this case, it seems like every, every moment of your practice is where something magical actually uh, does begin. Um, now, I, I'm going to take a quick look at time. So a couple more questions um, that um, your community, your commitment to community engagement is, is, is long. I mean, that seems to be something that really has driven your, your practice throughout your, you know, your working um, life. And you've done a lot of different kinds of projects. And I, um, wanted to bring one forth to see if you could talk about that a little bit. I think you had said that your YES project came as the result of We Sold a Winner. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that. So this was a long-term uh, social documentary project, which means that um, I don't consider myself a traditional documentary photographer. Uh, I have great respect for people who do that work, but um, I was interested in following the trail of this mysterious thing called state lotteries, which I learned was just billions and billions of dollars. Um, and so I, after doing some research, what I ended up doing was following the trail of the winning jackpots back to the small mom and pop stores where the tickets had been sold. And I was very fortunate that I was able to travel all across the country and I met uh, families and people from all over at these little tiny bodegas and family run stores. Um, and it's an incredible lens to see our country because on one hand, of course, there's the whole economic piece, but on the other hand, there's the piece of the family business and the family store. Um, and that was a whole, that opened up a whole nother kind of community. Um, Part of the beginning the YES project was after doing this work and following this trail for so many years, I sort of became, uh, I was traveling every day. When I wasn't teaching, I was always traveling. So, you know, for six or seven years uh, during breaks, during the summer, I was just traveling, traveling, traveling. And I began to miss making those kinds of connections in my community. And especially after the election in 2016, that started to feel important, like important work. It started to feel like, okay, I have done this thing, but I need to, I need to connect again and find out who we are, who am I, who are, who is the us out there? Um, and so it was really a, uh, a desire to engage in a very organic, physical way to kind of recreate and find out what are those connections and what can we make. So it's very different from you know, these uh, sort of physical uh, referential photographs of the stores. I mean, despite the fact that of course I'm using weather um, and the magic hour to create these uh, dramatic portraits. Mm -hmm place yeah so in all of your travels it which is was part of a, a different kind of practice home became 
the local became crucial as we were. Yeah, I missed it. I, I began to miss it. I didn't even realize it again until I think 2016 catalyzed for me to reconnect and, and, and seriously want to look around. I think part again is that, you know, walking, being outside, those kinds of random encounters has, have been a part of my practice since the 1980s uh, in New York City when I used to uh, wander and pick up found objects and take them home and create elaborate tabletop tableau. You know, and eventually the people's things led to people themselves. And uh, eventually that thread was, well, I live in a place and I also feel disconnected from the people who live there. So I've been wandering around with my camera for years and years and years. And, you know, there has been every decade, the, the phone has changed everything. You know, people really are in a bubble much more now than ever before. Take a walk and see not only, I'm not talking just about social distance now, but people really are glued to their phones outside. And um, it's shifting, I think, the way that we engage with one another as a society, as, as humans. And so you move from the larger landscape to the to a local landscape and from the grand, like this sublime kind of magical time of day to the intimacy of one body um, at one at one moment as a strategy. Yeah, to, to the sublime of chants and cyanotypes, those magical emanations that I don't use them in a controlled way. I allow the mistake and the chance to be become part of the making. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, again, I'm using them in a very particular way to free myself from the world of screens and, and sight, how I put it, because I, I really believe that that's what happens in the moment when we're making something, we are free of it. We're all engaged and talking and, you know, it's, it's very exciting. And, um, and I, I enjoy that process very much. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see. So, um, speaking of, ex you know, thinking about exchange, uh, once upon a time, all of the photographers in this series that Carrie Cushman organized, you were supposed to be sitting together, talking together, having a dialogue, sharing ideas. So I'm putting out a bit of an anachronistic conversation that you can have with uh, Takashi Arai. Um, you ended your talk, uh, a few moments ago, uh, reflecting on loss. Mm. And you also spoke of the sort of physical amelioration of the moment in regard to yours and Carlton Watkins practice. It's a great phrase. A and you quoted Roland Bart, who wrote so movingly about the photograph of a space of the that has been um, an illogical, I'm quoting him, an illogical conjunction between the here now mm -hmm. and the there then this yeah. place of negotiation, which is always anachronistic and, and always about the, the loss of whatever's there that's not there, but it's, it's shadow, it's precipitate is always there. And any photograph is an anachronism, um, taken or made at one moment and then displaying that moment as a trace um, going forward. And I, I, I suspect there are a lot of students who are here, mm -hmm. I have no idea who you are. A lot of our students have actually made uh, cyanotypes and it's, it's one of the strategies that they've used. So it'll be interesting to hear if there are any out there who have anything to say. But um, one of the things, um, one can never recuperate once, what once was, but one can point to it in, in marvelous ways, ways of, I mean, truly things that are a marvel, um, as I think you do. And um, I see a lot of marvel, the marvelous in your, and not anonymous series, which I'm gonna show a little bit in a moment, um, in which you form a collaboration, I think with time itself. Mm -hmm. But before I show that last slide, I just was really struck by some of the ways in which you work. And then this particular slide uh, that Takashi showed, recognizing that when we see images, we're seeing just the tiniest little tip of what's been made, not only right. now, but historically. The, the lost, the anonymous, the invisible, the damaged, um, what he calls unseen images. 
And that really, uh, that slide really struck me, I mean, in every conceivable way, given what he works on. But I, I was also thinking a lot when I saw that slide of your anonymous series. Mm -hmm. and, and I wonder if you could speak of that um, to our audience. Sure. I mean, thank you so much for adding this. I, I actually had to take this series out of the talk because it, it I went, went over the 30 minutes, you know, initially back in, um, we were supposed to be on stage together and I was giving this talk, of course, in a different time and <laughs> than it is now. Um, you know, this series I found during a year when I was very ill and in and out of the hospital, I came across, I spent a lot of time looking at photography books um, because I, I really couldn't make them. I just was, wasn't physically able and wasn't physically strong enough. And I came across these series of news. Um, and, and certainly they were collected because they were so striking, but I found them striking, but also found the idea that they only were remembered as being anonymous and given a date as somehow unfair. And I, it just made me restless. And I spent a lot of time just imagining to myself what they might've looked like outside the photographer's studio or what they, uh, what the, their relationship was with the photographer. Uh, and I gave myself permission, not only to imagine once I was well, to then start to think, well, how could I, how could I give them a second chance to not be anonymous anymore? How could I repair? How could I physically mend that anonymity and, and give them a different kind of life? And I don't really see them as being uh, the same person anymore. I do see them as like a doppelganger or an unknown ancestor or a relation from a different time. And, and that's another kind of freedom because I can, I can dress them not according to the time period in which the photograph was made. I can place them in a setting that's completely different from that uh, studio where the photograph was made. I think about them. I think about the bend of their back and what the gesture of their body language means. Um, I become very attached to them in many ways as individuals. Uh, which is what I think we do as photographers. You know, most, I know with my students too, you know, we get very involved with the images that we're making, with the spaces that we're trying to portray and the people. And, and these beings, I only knew them through the books, but they became a part of, in some ways, like an extended kind of family to me, mm -hmm. you know. I wonder if you could talk about your your process a little bit. I'm just so struck by how this particular this figure lifted out of another photograph who had been a studio nude, who had no, you know, just an object for the camera is now given such pathos. Um, but can you talk about your process because you actually stitched? It's not you just you gave them clothing. You handmade their the clothing, and can you talk about the process where where the um, where the backgrounds or their, their locations are. You've located them. Okay, so they, they're all different. So here on the left is Walden Pond, uh, which I have an enormous affection for and spent a lot of time there, especially when my son was young. And on the right is actually um, the Charles River <laughs> during a snowstorm. So, um, but they're very transformative. I'm not sure most people would recognize that. The sewing, so they are unique photographs. I've, as you said, I've, I'm actually physically sewing the photograph. And, you know, it initially part of, to get back to that idea of doubt, I, I really thought this is never gonna work, but I was compelled to try. And the reason is that I quickly saw that giving them clothing completely changed the way a viewer related to them. It made us pay attention not to their bodies, not to their nakedness, but to them, to their gaze or to the shape of their body. Um, and I realized I could figure out techniques where once I did some initial sewing, I could just weave the thread sort of in and out of 
and on top of the photograph so as not to puncture the image too many times. So each time I sew one of these, I'm sort of learning new techniques, which personally for me is hysterical because I'm a terrible sewer. Um, and yet I redeem myself each time. You know, and my mother was such a good sewer, which is, I have her sewing box. And so it was this wonderful kind of funny connection, you know, and I did those sewn screens way back, but I'm not a physical, like I can't sew pants or right. Exactly. I can't sew that, but I can, I can do this. I can sew a screen. Um, I can sew a photo. I can engineer how to create something that simulates the clothing. Um, and it gives me enormous pleasure to offer an alternate life to these little figures from time who are only known as anonymous. Mm -hmm. I, I just love that. It's a different kind of handmade, <laughs> handmade photograph. And I, you know, I, as you said, that, that was one of the things that struck me. Suddenly the, this woman in each of these cases is somebody who holds the gaze elsewhere. Um, she has she has presence, but it's a different. It's another form of anachronism that was really striking and very poignant as I thought about it. As you have talked about your your mother and her, you know, her sewing box, and she's no longer with you. So the gestures of your very hand, in some ways, are anachronistic as well. There's kind of a a recuperative means that these speak about and I also love that they're they're scanned they're sewn they're stitched together in so many different ways so I, I love the kind of um outwardness about the notion of the stitch or the suture um, in these and finally I know that we're soon out of time but I wanted to return uh, to these as well because you know here we all are if we're lucky enough to live in a place mm -hmm. that has windows and if we're lucky enough to have some version of well, I guess we've all had a lot of time on our hands. Um, I think we talked about this the other day about how we've all become so much more attentive mm. if we have enough food, we become attentive. Um, and um, looking out the window early on in this pandemic was, was one of the, it was kind of like the trope of the pandemic. Everybody looking out their windows, sharing images of windows, views out the windows. So I, I these are, looking very different to me than the way they used to. The one on the right, I cannot help but ask you. I mean, the decision to have the window pole at the top charms the heck out of me. And, and in every way it's charming. I, I love them all of this series, I must say, but in this case, with all of your sewing and your embroidery, I can't help but think about Marcel Duchamp and bring us back to the question of chance before we end this part of the presentation and the audience can ask questions. Oh, Duchamp is, you know, he's the guy. Uh, I don't think any of us, I think so many practices, contemporary art would not have happened without him. I, I mean, you know, I want to just go back to this idea. So you, you, there's so many things in, in what you've just said. One is, I think when we look out a window we are also involved in this very interior process because we are, we're meditating on something. We're also gazing outside. So we can see outside, but we're also having a kind of inward dialogue, which of course <laughs> we did a lot once quarantine started in the lockdown. When I was making these, a lot of it came from, um, I was thinking a lot again about my mother. I was a new parent, a new mother myself and, um, both of my parents uh, were dead and uh, being a new parent made me really think about them a lot. And so I was, you know, in some ways, the series is, is a little bit about mourning, but mourning in a physical uh, uh, relational sense of reflecting and coming to terms, again, not in a sad way, but the physical action, you know, I would do these things on the screen and then I would have to put them up on the window and I'd have to make the photograph because I can't really see how something here is gonna to relate to something that's way out there. Um, and so again, there I don't really know what they're gonna look like until I, the film is developed. This, these were done with four by five film. Um, I asked friends 
at the time there was an abandoned building across the way now there's a, a high rise so this view is gone talking about time mm -hmm. uh, but i asked friends to sort of climb up to the building and look back at me so that we could be in conversation and uh, and I could punctuate because I, I was thinking about those 19th century paintings where the little figure along the horizon and when we look at those paintings what happens is unconsciously again to go back to this optical unconscious we are inserting ourselves to become the little shepherd you know or the person in the boat and it's the same thing here um, and you know it's this idea of all the loose ends and the ins and the outs of you know, motherhood, femalehood, teaching, parent, um, being in the world. Mm -hmm. And the process is, you know, the, the reason I love chance and Duchamp um, is that there's so much we don't know. I, I mean, I, there's a ton I don't know. There's so much we as a, as a human culture do not know. And the only way we will f figure that out is if we welcome the fact that we can control everything and that there is so much that we don't know into our lives. Edie, I think that's a wonderful place to, to stop. Thank you so much. I was looking at this, the window on the right, thinking about parallel universes, mm. endless possibilities. So I wanna thank you so much. I think, is am I correct that it's now time for some questions? Yes, thank you, Pat, and thank you, Edie. Um, I will go ahead now and bring in some questions from our attendees. We have a few about the actual process uh, and technique of the cyanotype, so I'll start there. Uh, one from Cynthia, who is wondering if the chemicals used in cyanotypes are toxic. Oh, so there is a lot of, um, I don't think so. To me, they are not, they are uh, quite friendly. I mean, I, we're not eating them, we're not ingesting them. We are just laying down upon them. Uh, sometimes if they transferred, we would just wash them off with soap and water. Um, I, I think they're pretty inert. Um, you know, it's like, this is what makes horse races. I think if you asked somebody else, they might say that uh, they are much more um, toxic than I believe they are. But my humble view is that they are they are not nearly as toxic as the traditional darkroom chemistry is. Okay. Thank you, Pat. Thank you so much. Um, and then we have a, another question from Maggie. It's uh, long, but it's very insightful. So I'm going to read it a little slowly. She says, with the messages of unity and crossing borders you are creating with your cyanotypes, the images of the people become washed out as white regardless of the color of the person. What are your thoughts on the whitening of the body in the cyanotype within the context of your themes of unity? With Black Lives Matter, the election, and the growing confrontations against racism, how might cyanotypes or handmade photography be produced in the inverse to create unity without uniformity? Um, that's a, a lovely question. And of course, um, I do think about the washing out and the production of, you know, they're white because the paper that I'm coating on uh, is a kind of, of whiteness. I don't, I see that in, uh, in a different way because it's, it's a, a kind of tracing of the person. Um, so while I understand and appreciate the, uh, you know, what, what Cynthia is saying, I mean, I actually did reverse some of them. I didn't get to show them, but I have reversed them and I, I love what happens. And I agree. I mean, I hope again to do more of this and to maybe play more with that uh, reversal and have the reversal become a much more active part of the process. Uh, yeah, I think a lot about it. I think. I hope we're all thinking about this uh, and that we continue to, to think and actively try to right this tremendous wrong. Sorry, Edie, what do you mean by reversal? That the, the body would so, be- the Yeah, so basically um, when I was making those silk, uh, when I was translating them from paper to silk, 
I created a digital copy of the cyanotype uh -huh. that also enables me to invert it so that the white interior becomes blue and the blue exterior becomes more like sunlight, if you gotcha. can imagine that. Yeah. So it, I mean, I could share my screen and show you, but I don't know if we could do that right now. But again, I so I was playing with that and it's a wonderful actually process of, I mean, the reversal is so interesting because rather than having the ethereal look of air or water, they really do feel more like sunlight and we are using sunlight to make them. So I really liked the way the reversals look. And, um, and I, again, my hope is going forward that I could probably use that in a much more active way, uh, you know, to address the kinds of what sounds like concerns coming from Cynthia. Yeah, that would be really interesting. I look forward to seeing it. Yeah, me too. <laughs> um, another question from Cindy who asks, how do you find strength in moving forward work, moving forward with art making when anxiety and depression are so present right now? So Sini, thank you so much. Sini is a participant um, and also a student and now friend. Uh, you know, such a good question. It's so important. I, I want to reiterate that I've been doing this long enough to know that when I am at my most depressed, when I am at my most, you know, and the events of the past seven months have been so awful. There have been so many wrongs. I continue to mourn for Brianna Taylor, who was murdered in her home, for all of the young Black men who are murdered by people sworn to protect them. Uh, children being taken from their parents at the border. There's just, it's just endless, the parade of, of awfulness that's been happening. And I know that making something is a way for me to counter the overwhelming feelings of sadness that current events do. They actually give me a little strength to then get up and do something more proactive. Not only go along and teach and do all the advising and things that I do, but you know, volunteer to work at a food pantry and help make sure that um, I'm doing something to alleviate the food insecurity in my community. Um, so I do know that making things gives me strength. And I would say to Sini, you know it too. So you just have to begin and not let go of the idea of perfectness and preciousness and just make something. Thank you for that, Edie, and for all your different forms of making. Um, another question, this is from Linda. Do you employ any form of meditation, uh, for example, mindfulness, to expand your own awareness and or that of your students? Hmm. It, uh, it is a way of accessing the subconscious and mystical in each precious moment. Um, wow, what a wonderful comment. I, I don't, in my teaching, I would love to. Um, it's very difficult at this point in time because we're also virtual. Um, I, I guess in a way, I feel like when we're engaged in making something, we are involved in another kind of mindfulness, even though it's, it's very different from meditation because it's so much more physical, but I wonder in some ways if getting outside that bubble that we're all so carefully constructing is a kind of mindfulness, right? So one, when we step outside that, um, we are engaging in mindfulness even though it's not in the traditional form of, of meditation. But you know, again, I'm, all, I'm always open to all ideas. So I'll, I'll tuck that away. <laughs> Linda, and um, I'll think about that. Um, another process question. How do you rinse, process, or fix the cyanotypes you are making outdoors with the participants in the community projects? So, you know, I don't process them until I get home later. So basically, I am making them. I wouldn't say I leave home with, uh, you know, five packages containing uh, 
10 or 20 cyanotypes. They're all taped to a board. I have, you know, very elaborate ways of remembering what package has what. Um, and I just keep going until they're all used up. And so if I leave my house at nine o'clock in the morning, sometimes I don't come home until, you know, it's five or six at night. And then usually I'm starving. I have to eat something. <laughs> um, and then I will go to the, my dark room and uh, they're processed in water. They're processed and fixed in water. Uh, you can accelerate the sort of fixing, which is an oxidation of air by adding a little hydrogen peroxide to your final water bath, but then that's it, they're permanent. Um, and then I, the next day is I have to take pictures and send them to all the participants so that they have a sort of copy of what's happened. Um, yes, yeah, so I don't do them outside. I know that there are people who have done that. Um, I do not. Great, thank you. Um, and I think we have time for one last question. Uh, this is from Bridget. Aww. Does the idea of time, ongoing past and future as embodied in your anonymous uh, series, the beach scenes and the yes project, liberate you from traditional photography as your work becomes unique expressions of the imagination? Um, yeah, I mean, of course. It, I, I do want to stress that I still love making pictures with all my cameras um, and with all the processes. You know, that's why I started by saying just, I love this medium. I think for me and my practice, I think this medium is very flexible. And so I really enjoy, it's like a language, right? And what's so wonderful is that I'm not limited to speaking a single language with this medium. I, I am fluent in so many ways and it allows me to address and speak to so many different people and, and um, you know, ways of interpretation and being. And I find that uh, extraordinary. Um, what liberates me with the handmade processes is being outside of the physical world that sometimes I feel is so uh, frustrating um, and uncertain, right? Uh, and it liberates me from the screen. It, and it allows the mysteries to come back into my uh, practice of making images. And that is so inspiring and 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 joyful and you know if if it helps somebody else feel the same way then that's a good day well hearing you talk about it and the work itself of course is so inspiring Evie I think your son has piped into the ch chat he says to tell you that you're the best and I have to say I agree Love um, you, buddy. <laughs> so thank you so much for sharing your work and for teaching us about, you know, the liberating power of chance in handmade photography. And thank you, Pat, also for further illuminating Edie's work for us with your ever insightful uh, questions and comments. And thank you to all of our attendees for joining us today. Uh, the next Handmade uh, Photography Today virtual artist talk series, it continues this fall on Thursday, November 12th with Myra Green. Uh, and then on December 10th, we look forward to welcoming Will Wilson. We hope you all can join us again. And thank you so much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Bye, everyone.